So it's pretty common and popular to, uh, to go to a job interview and be asked to uh, uh, program FizzBuzz. And uh, I think now that microservices are such a popular kind of movement, I think it's time to, to, that we equip ourselves for, for uh, uh, distributed FizzBuzz, the, the microservices interview test. So before we begin, I want to review the rules of FizzBuzz. Uh, uh, in a normal interview where you're asked to build, uh, to write a FizzBuzz program, you count from 1 to 100. Each time uh, one of those numbers is uh, divisible by 3, you output Fizz. Each time a number is divisible by 5, you output Buzz. If they're divisible by f uh, both of those numbers, like 15, you output FizzBuzz. For all the other numbers, we output the number itself. Now, one of the things that happens uh, when, when you really need to extend a presentation duration and need some filler is <laughs> to review the origins and history of the thing that you're talking about. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> the origin of FizzBuzz. Uh, about 20 years ago, it became popularized as a children's game. But before that, it was actually a drinking game. So you and your pals would get together in the tavern, and uh, you would, uh, you would uh, take turns. And each, one, each, each player says the next number, or FizzBuzz, or whatever. Uh, and, of course, uh, you lose if you end up getting it wrong. And the lesson that I take from this is any game that's suitable for adults when they're drinking is also suitable for children when they're sober. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, I'm going to kind of give you an example of two people playing FizzBuzz together, player one and player two. And they're, they're at the tavern together, and they order a round of beer, and then Player one decides to throw the gauntlet down and challenge the other to a duel of fizzbuzz. He says, one. Now, player two, she responds with two, because she's, she's always willing to take up a challenge. So the game is afoot. And player one responds. It's, it's, it's player one's cue, fizz. And then they realize, this is a really, really boring game. <laughs> it's not very fun. So they're going to make some, um, unfortunately, they're going to make some really bad decisions here. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens next. So player two finally resumes the challenge and musters up uh, her best four that she can muster. And now player one is forced to uh, uh, get the next one correct. But unfortunately, four rounds in, player one fails miserably. So. That's the model for a FizzBuzz microservice. Uh, it's, it's, it's instead of having one program count from 1 to 100, we're going to simulate having different players or different clients. So the rules here are the clients of the microservice, whether that's another microservice or a web front end or something like that. Uh, the client, clients will submit the next answer, and the service will keep track of the game counter. And whenever a client submits a correct answer, the service is going to advance its, its counter internally and it's going to publish an event message. When a client submits an incorrect answer, the service is going to uh, uh, reject that, uh, that turn. And so these messages that we're sending, the command message and the, the event messages that we're publishing, that's the API or, or the interface of this service. Uh, that's its, that's how, it's, how you interact with it. And when, whenever we're talking about sending messages, uh, there's, there's uh, a reality that comes into play, which is, Messages are sent over computer networks. And that means that the fallacies of distributed systems come into play. And we need to remember, whenever we're making any network calls, uh, uh, actually in any context, we should never assume that the network is reliable. We should never assume that the latency is zero or it doesn't matter. Uh, we should never presume to have infinite bandwidth, et cetera. And those, those, first, two, the net, those two, first two fallacies the network is reliable and latency is zero. I'm going to focus on those next. So because the network is not reliable, we can count on messages never arriving sometimes. And other times, we can count on messages arriving more than once. And we can also count on those messages arriving in a different order than they were sent. This is reality. There's no getting around the laws of physics here. And because that latency is not zero, services can only really operate or work with their own local data. So they can't query other services because in the time it takes to get a response back, that information might be out of date. And so you can make a wrong decision uh, based on inconsistent data. So we don't do that. 
And we also have to be prepared for our uh, microservice to cope with uh, failures in way, uh, failure modes that did not exist uh, uh, in fully synchronous systems. So that's kind of the first big kicker here is, is when we had FizzBuzz, the program, it was very short. It was about 17 lines of code. But once we, once we have the network uh, uh, and messaging uh, in play, we now have to deal with failures and recover from them. Otherwise, our service is going to crash and burn very, very quickly. And the other thing that we, we, the other conclusion that we have to draw is that synchronous request responses uh, like HTTP get calls, those are out uh, because uh, uh, for the aforementioned reason that the data could be out of date by the time we use it. So all of that is to set up this contraption uh, here. We have clients that are sending command messages over a command queue to the FizzBuzz service, which is going to publish events. Now I'm going to get into the, to the details, and I'm going to show you some code. First of all, we have our, our message uh, objects, our command message and event message. They're actually not really, they are objects in Ruby, but the more important thing is that they're schemas and they're contracts that our services agree on with other services uh, to exchange information. And so we often have this, uh, uh, this pairing of command messages and event messages. The command is to take a turn, and the event is turn taken. And there's other events that I'll, I'll go over in a minute. One thing to note is very, very commonly when we have command messages that publish event messages, we copy the common attributes. Uh, in this case, game ID, answer, and time are copied from the command message straight to the event message when they're written. And we also have uh, uh, two timestamps on our event message. And the reason for that is, uh, well, you have two notions of time. You have when the client requested the turn to be taken, and you have when the service actually got around to processing that command. And it's very important to keep those two straight. So let's look at the, uh, the command messages and the event messages. Here's our schemas. We have take turn. It's a command message. You can start a new FizzBuzz game by taking the first turn, for instance. And uh, if your turn is accepted by the game, in other words, it's correct, the service will publish turn taken for all the world to see. If, you're, if you get it wrong, though, if your answer is wrong, the service will record and publish turn rejected. And finally, th there's exit criteria for the game. Either the counter reaches 100 successfully or somebody uh, gets it wrong and the game ends abruptly. OK, so the next element I want to talk about is the entity. And I'm actually going to show you some real code for this. And, and uh, well, I'll, I'll do a brief walkthrough as we go through it. OK, so this is our entity. It's a data structure. Uh, you can think of it as being somewhat similar to a, a model in Rails, but there's no persistence attached to it whatsoever. And uh, if you really want to crush an interview, separating your persistence layer from your entity layer is a great way to impress the interviewer, I promise. It impresses me. So we have a command method, take turn, and we have a predicate method, correct, that, that tells you whether a proposed answer is correct or not. So you can see the core logic of FizzBuzz is here uh, in, in the correct predicate method. And so this entity keeps track of the state of the game. And it can answer questions about whether somebody got an answer correct or not. Um, and that, I think that's enough for the entity. So the next one I, I want to show is the command handler. Uh, and remember that clients are sending command messages over a command queue directed at the FizzBuzz service. Take a turn. And there's, there's got to be a handler class that handles that message type. So I'll show you that next. Now, the first thing we'll see here in the command handler is there's a lot of boilerplate. Boilerplate is a great way to really show that you are capable of of making a class really long and full of stuff that really shows that you know microservices really well. Below that boilerplate, we have some, some business logic. That's, it's really hard to point up there at this angle. Uh, so when we take the turn, we fetch the game, that game entity. We fetch it from a store, a repository. 
And based on the correctness of the answer that's submitted, we either re re uh, publish turn taken or turn rejected. And then we write uh, whatever event is, 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 the, is the one that we write. We write it to the uh, event stream. We'll go over that later. It, don't worry. If it seems complicated, the more complexity, the more likelihood you have at really impressing your, your audience. There's also something uh, akin to optimistic locking going on. So when we fetch the entity from the store, we get a version back, and then we're putting it back in on our right. And when, you, you know, when, you're, when you're in an interview, you really got to highlight how, how, how much you know about mechanical details like optimistic concurrency and, and things like that. So one thing I showed you is I showed you an entity that, that doesn't have any persistence attached to it, and I showed you a store that can fetch the entity. So how do we, how do we get a game entity from the store? How does that happen? And what, what are we doing with those events that we publish? It turns out that the answer to both of those questions is, is, uh, is, is the same because we're using event, sor uh, sorry, event sourcing to track the state of our entities. And we have something called a projection. This thing is really going to impress them, trust me. All right. So we, we, can, we, we can imagine that this projection is being actuated with a game entity that, that is uh, newly formed. And we're reading all of the events that have been published about the game in the past, and we're applying each one to the entity. So on line 9, we set the game ID. You know, on line 11 and 12, we're getting the timestamp from the message. It's packaged as an ISO 8601 string. Again, when you have the letters ISO or RFC followed by a number, you are killing that interview, I promise. <laughs> so we take the turn which, uh, on line 14, which is, which is going to advance our game state. And of course, when the game is ended, we're going we're gonna to set the ended time timestamp, ended at, ended time. So there's one other element that I just want to give you a brief walkthrough to, uh, of, and that's the event handlers. And they're going to look a lot like command handlers, actually. And that's because command messages and event messages are made of this. They're both messages. They can both be handled the same way. So here we have more boilerplate, again, boilerplate. Very sharp. And we handle turn taken by querying the game entity and determining if the game has met its, its, its uh, victory conditions, i.e., have, have we reached 100, or has the game already been ended? And if so, uh, uh, we're, we're going to write a game ended event. So we handle every single turn taken event but only when the exit criteria of the game is met do we publish game ended. Turn rejected, on the other hand, it's going to end the game abruptly according to the rules that are completely arbitrary. And so it's going to always uh, write game ended unless, unless the game has already been ended before. So I'm going to give you a live coding demo because that's a real great way to embarrass yourself. And I'm a big fan of embarrassing myself publicly. Here we go. So up on the, on the top pane, I've got the service, the FizzBuzz service running. And on the bottom, I've got an interactive IRB console where I can submit. I have handy help, uh, utility helper methods that will issue command messages for me. So the, obviously, the game hasn't started yet. So I'm going to uh, give it the first value. There we go. Does anybody want to wager what the next correct answer is? Is it buzz? It is not buzz. It's fizz. There we go. So that's our demo. Thank you. But wait, there's more. So I remember I talked about the distributed systems fallacies. We know that messages can arrive out of order more than once. And none of the code I showed you really had all that, uh, those affordances necessary to handle and, and uh, recover from those, those situations. And what I'm really suggesting is I, I, I haven't built item potence into the turn-taking system. So when we issue a, a take turn command, 
it, it can be uh, processed more than, the same message can be processed more than once, and that is uh, definitely a huge problem. So now is where you're really going to, uh, th you know, we're at the point now where you've already aced the interview. This is about leverage for the, the negotiations that are going to follow. <laughs> you're going to bring up three really awesome patterns. The I mean, patterns. The item potency key pattern. I'm pat by the way, I'm very passionate about patterns. The second, the second pattern we're going to use uh, to make the turn-taking system item potent is the reservation pattern. And then I'm going to show you the sequence number pattern. So we're just going to fold that code into the, the code we've already seen. It'll be really simple uh, and, and wonderful. Um, Nathan. Where's that coming from? Oh. Nathan. I totally didn't know this was going to happen. Uh, I find this uh, highly <laughs> questionable. Borderline objectionable. Are you really standing here in front of all these fine people who are just trying to? J uh, uh, it j Come on up. So, you want help? I don't want your help. Fair enough. I've been taking some notes while you've been talking. You're talking about events and item potents and item potents keys and and fluble grommets and all kinds of things. And I got to tell you, I've been doing microservices my whole life. <laughs> all the way back to last December. <laughs> and on my team, we're using Go. And you're talking about Ruby. So we all know that microservices have to be done in another language. <laughs> Are you telling us all that that's not true? I, I think uh, if you're going to adopt a new architectural style like microservices, that's probably the worst time to switch programming languages. Yeah. All right, I got another point. <laughs> I got another point. I've been doing microservices my whole life. And every it, it shows. blog post I've read from other people on my team Say that microservices are about HTTP APIs and gRPC. Well, I, I'm how not, do you respond to that? You've I'm, not talked about. You talk about messages and events and item potents, fluble grommets. I mean, are we all supposed to just b believe you that what we've been writing about microservices from our web development background is somewhat not correct? Come on. Yeah, I, I, I have to say the most important principle of service architectures is autonomy. And uh, while it's certainly the case that a service can have a web API, uh, it's, it's uh, very, very uh, dangerous to, to not understand the need for the machinery underneath for item potence and, and other such uh, uh, necessities. That's a fair point. So if you have an API, you can't have service autonomy. Yeah. Because of that thing you said earlier about when you, okay. Yeah, okay. remember I, what no, I was. No, 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 I'm not finished. Every single person on my team is talking about Docker and Kubernetes when we're talking about microservices. And we're really, really, really excited. We're all going to Docker and Kubernetes training. It's going to be a week, and we get to go away. So are you telling me, are you literally, because you've not mentioned containers at all. And I, everybody knows containers. Containers and microservices are basically the same well, thing. Well, a, a container is just a package with an operating system inside of it. That's how you want to deploy. That's fine, but it's not necessary or even part of the same universe of, as microservices. It's an architectural style that doesn't specify how you're supposed to package them. Well, how would I test all my microservices on my laptop? Huh? You don't. Huh? Yeah, if your service is autonomous, it's a, sta it's a computer program that stands on its own. Ergo, my development context should never need to involve or should very rarely need to involve I'm more than one service. still going to the Docker training. Well, <laughs> you know... Power all right, to you. all right. Answer then this one, smarty trousers. <laughs> Thank you. Why not, instead of doing all this item potence keys and reservation patterns and all this stuff, why didn't you just use a message broker that guarantees exactly once delivery? Huh? 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 Uh, uh, how, right? how, I, how does it guarantee exactly once delivery? You take a message off the queue, right? You're with me? You understand this messages? Yeah, yeah. Apparently, right? And then you send an ACK when you're done. OK, and, and how do you send the ACK? Like over the network. 
Well, can't that fail? Yeah, but so what happens if it fails? Then you, then you handle the message again. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that doesn't work either, huh? All right, I got you. Afraid not. I got you. A very important and wise man once said, the first law of distributed systems is not distributing your systems. How uh, do you respond to that, oh, wise one? I, I, I believe the original. Actually, let, me take, let me take this one. Okay, okay. The real first law of distributed systems is to not distribute your objects. There's no law of distributed systems that says don't distribute it, don't distribute your systems. It says if you're going to build distributed systems, you're going to need to know the difference between a distributed object and a distributed system. And we had these things in the old days called distributed object brokers. Corbo was one of them, DCOM was another one. Um, not to, not so that Rails is left out, it also developed Active Resource, uh, made it a default gem, and then two years later removed it as a fault, default gem, as one might expect. And you get distributed objects, by the way, when you build microservices based on APIs and not based on loosely, cou loosely coupled events. So the fun of all this, and the real head fake here is, there are a ton of myths of microservices. They're mostly reinforced by us as developers in our own developer communities because we're really sort of hearing about what microservices are from our peers and our peers not always but frequently enough aren't really coming from a background of uh, of distributed systems and therefore we really got to do what we can do with, with the tools we have and we sort of apply our predispositions of web development and web tooling upon it but that is really leading to a lot of the circumstances where you're seeing failures in these projects and it usually results in creating what we call a distributed monolith, which is effectively a monolith with network hops between your active record objects, and that is always failure prone, and that's ultimately why active resource was pulled out of the default uh, Rails installation. We're uh, gonna do this workshop uh, next week, and uh, this slide should have updated, uh, and I don't understand Linux. And uh, there's a discount code here. Your touchpad doesn't work like a touchpad. <laughs> Somebody give me a Mac. This is the kind of torture that I just. This was not I supposed love. to happen. <laughs> well, I was to proceed to the last slide. So we have a discount. There's, there's, there's a. Uh, there you go. We have a discount code. Keep Ruby. It's a 20% off discount. Uh, for the workshop we're doing. It's three days. It's, it's uh, online and remote, unless you want to do it in person in Austin. Uh, and then uh, we can talk about changing that discount code if you want access to it. However, um, and we're also going to give away uh, 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 one free ticket to the workshop. Uh, if you, you want to win that prize, great. You've got to make it. It's a three-day workshop, so, so make yourself available. That's going to cover all of the distributed systems theory uh, and all of the stuff we can do in Ruby right now with Ruby, with distributed services, with the kind of stuff we're doing, building scalable and autonomous systems uh, based on uh, event sourcing and, uh, and uh, event stores. And uh, with that, let's hit the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.